First and foremost, want to thank you for joining us here. Everybody, please feel comfortable, feel right at home. Uh, we've got handsome Sam manning the bar. There he is. There he is, running in. Uh, we call him that because he looks just like Ryan Philippe. <laughs> so feel free at any time to jump up, grab food, grab drinks. We've got wine, beer. You got, did you bring your blender? No, I'm kidding. I know you did. So margaritas. We've got margaritas on tap. Uh, so at any point, please feel comfortable to jump up and grab a drink or some food. So we are here to discuss what we are, first of all, which is an exempt market dealer and, we'll, and what it is that we do, as well as some of the projects that we have and various different ways that we can be of service to you, whether it's to help you grow your portfolio, make money, or work with us in various different ways. So we've got people from all sorts of walks of life, realtors, mortgage brokers, and many different options that we can offer to somebody in that sector. So as an exempt market dealer, some of you may be aware of what that is, some may not. It is the Canadian term for what is essentially a broker dealer. So we work with issuers or people who have different projects who need equity to be raised for them, whether that's in real estate, we've got a couple of gold mines in Mexico that we're looking at, we're looking at a couple of tech deals, pre-IPO deals. Mostly what we do though is focused around real estate and mostly focused in up and coming markets like Kelowna or Langford where the acquisition price of land has not yet caught up to the demand for housing. That is essentially why we exist. We exist to help with the equity side, put together offerings, make sure that we are uh, working within the parameters set forth by the Securities Commission, compliance, suitability, anti-money laundering, making sure that somebody's portfolio is suitable for them. So with that, uh, I'll pass it on to Kobe and Kobe can introduce himself. Kobe's sure. got a long background in the wealth management space. Yeah, so I'm Kobe, I'm the CEO and principal of Charterhouse Prime Investments. As Warren was alluding to, part of my background, I spent about just under two decades in wealth management. So I worked for brokerages, I worked for banks and credit unions. My last stint was solely as a financial planner working for Coast Capital Savings and I built a book about $125 million. I left that all and started this beautiful dealer with my partner. So part of the reason why I decided that I wanted to leave the industry was more so that everything that was offered through the bank channel or the wealth management channels are just traditional investments per se. So you would have you'd be financial planning, I would do this beautiful financial plan and it would say you need this target rate of return and then the vehicle, the mechanism to get them to that point wasn't often geared the best, to the best way to get them to their, to their end goal. So then I started exploring, okay, you know, what are the alternatives in the space? And those alternatives led me to explore what alternative investments are out there. So does this look familiar to anybody? A portfolio of 60 stocks, 40 bonds, is something very typical in the mutual fund space that you would see average churn about 6.7. This would be gross of fees in my experience. If you took it and you went net of fees, you're probably drilling that back down like two to 2.3 percent. So now you're looking at a rate about, you know, like four, four and a half percent, five percent, which is more probably along the way. The reason why these portfolio recently alternative markets have come to the forefront is because of that chart. It was well documented in the beginning of January what happened to the market. Can anybody tell me what happened in January 2022 in the beginning of that market? Any, COVID. Sorry? COVID. Okay, so one of the things there, yeah. So there was a lot of, one of the main things, interest rates, yeah. So one of the main things was we had this crazy amount of inflation. So this crazy amount of inflation that led in through the supply chain and all the disruption had made the market such that the banks and the monetary policy had to be match that and increase rates. So that, what it does, to, if you increase rates to the bond portfolio, it just throws in this tailwind. And not only couple, so interest rates went up and at the same time there was a war. So the Russia invasion onto the Ukraine also threw the, the, the stock market into the tailwind. So what happened was this conventional portfolio, which was bellwether safe for many, many, many years, all of a sudden came and became extremely tested. And not only did your stocks go down because the, the market was very, there's a lot of turmoil there. Now interest rates go up, that works, that does the inverse for bond prices. So that went down. So now your safe portfolio now has 
done nothing but go down. And it's the first time we've seen it happen like this. So the compelling thing, so when we look at the CPP, that's one of the biggest pension uh, plans in, in Canada, it's $539 billion. And that pension plan, if you look into the asset allocation, do you think it just has stocks and bonds in it? It doesn't. So you drill into it, and if you, the, the, the CEO of CPP Investment Board, he said, we delivered a 6.8% return. We did very well last year. The reason we did well last year is not because we held stocks and bonds, it's because we had private equity, infrastructure, real estate, and private credit. That's what delivered the return. So this is what we're, when we look at portfolios of today, the reason why you can look at this and see that one with the addition of private equity or having a higher rate of return on a risk adjusted basis is because it offsets that volatility and increases the amount of return over, over a period of time. So that's why we're here today kind of sharing how real estate private equity can tie into your existing portfolio through your RSPs and TFSAs and help you increase your yield. One of the offerings that we have is called the Goldstream Residence Project. Through our dealer, exempt market dealer, we work under National Instrument 31103. That national instrument has a few re ways that a dealer can raise capital through a few exemptions. And part of those exemptions that we use are called the accredited, accredited investor or eligible investor exemption. So that would be through an offering memorandum. So what happens is our issuer, so we're a dealer, we work with an issuer, and this issuer, we raise capital for them through our dealer in a regulated manner. So we are registered with the BCSC, the British Columbia Securities Commission, with the Alberta Securities Commission, and the Ontario Securities Commission. So that's how we're able to go to the public, and a lot of you folks probably came through those lead gens, and raise capital for them. So this particular structure is called a GPLP strategy. So a GPLP strategy is when you have a general partner who with their covenant, they'll take on a project like this, do the land assembly, get it to a point where uh, it's pretty much massed, develop an offering memorandum, and then offer it to the public. A certain portion of that overall capital structure is offered to the public. And you can come, help, you can come in and participate in the project again, as a limited partner, and earn a 15% annual return through done through your RSPs, tax-free savings accounts. So that's how these type of portfolios or these offerings are structured. This is, there's the, that was one of three that we have on our shelf. We have the Goldstream, Arbutus Walk, and Mountain View Gardens now. And like Warren alluded to, there's, there's a few more that will be coming down. Um, no, so we don't charge fees for, let's say you went in through the, that's a very good question, RSP, tax percent, or a limited partner. Um, no, there's no fees for you coming in as an investor. So you, let's say, put in 25,000. 25,000 would return to you. Tacked on would be the 15% return. The fees are quite, and the mutual fund in the world, yeah, so you would get, like, let's say, there's that 6.7 return, then you'd have to deduct the management expense ratio to get to that net for 4.5%. 4 very good question. So our dealer, we focus on real estate private equity for the most, for the bulk of what we do is because we have experience in that. So when I was doing my wealth management practice, in conjunction on the side of my desk, I was also running a real estate development portfolio. So done that for many years as well. And that allows me to understand all the metrics. So if somebody comes to me and we get, we feel calls weekly of other developers that want to access our dealer to raise capital for their own individual projects. Daily. daily now. <laughs> so through networking events like this, we've met a lot of people that are, you know, people are working in that industry trying to raise capital. And yeah, we're feeling, we're feeling a lot of calls with people looking for help. But when we go through the metrics, they're not always what we would look for if we're gonna do a public offering. So what we do essentially is we will as a team, we'll have a round table and we're gonna underwrite your deal. So that when we talk about underwriting, what we're doing is we're looking at all your 
financial statements, your performance, your management experience, see how long you've been doing it, do a micro macro overview to determine are you actually going to be able to, like can we put you on our shelf with comfort, do a public offering and see if we can deliver that return back to you? Or can you deliver the project through, uh, through that? Or how long would it take? So quite often we're saying no. One of the big companies uh, back east, he's a pretty famous guy he's on HDTV, he approached us recently. Um, they work basically in the primary markets and they, we said no to them because their return and their, what they could deliver, we didn't think the metrics were as good as what we could offer in the secondary markets. Uh, I'll explain that in a sec here as well. So yeah, we go through the offering, uh, the financials, we do the micro, micro macro outlook, and then for the legal regulatory compliance, we just, we have uh, in-house counsel that just reviews all the, all the documents to make sure that it's all fit for public consumption. So that's how well, we, we go about look it. At where our issuer, so our issuer, which is the Sentara Group, they operate again in the secondary markets. So they, like Morgan was saying, in Kelowna, in the Okanagan, or on Vancouver Island. And a lot ha has been said about uh, the Vancouver Island and the growth that they've experienced. Much akin to what's happened in Surrey. I've had some conversation, we first came in here today about, wow, there's a lot of towers here now. <laughs> so the, the growth here has been extremely powerful over the last little while. And you can see that over here. But then when we layer that over what's happening in Langford, not too many people are familiar with what's happening in Langford. Langford also experiencing the same type of growth as a Surrey. And the demographics are quite similar. Age, uh, medium income, and then obviously growth in the population. So. We were, uh, Cameron says that um, Langford is the, the, the Surrey of the island, put it that way. So, that, so that's, that's what we, we but, not, but yeah, yeah, exactly, much nicer. <laughs> yeah. Just because there's a lot of water, right? Yeah, they got really nice golf courses in the mountains. Yeah, so they got, yeah, nice, nice golf courses, mountains, and some water. So that's kind of how we see it. So if you're not very familiar with it, it's just about 15, 20 minutes west of Victoria and it's part of the Capital Regional District. And the previous uh, mayor that was there, he was pro-development. And he would get things pushed through council and make sure that everything is on going uh, as to the developer's plan so then we can create infrastructure there. Luckily the Sentara Group had most of their developments already passed through to a DP or DP submission. So that was done before the new council has come through. There's still, I mean, the new council can't handle the straight the influx that's happening now, but we're lucky Sentara has a conduit into the city uh, already, so they're well on their way to have the development. So done. for anybody that is at the end interested in one of these projects, it's worth doing your due diligence on Langford as a city. So there's no magic to this, it's why we're there. The acquisition price of land is very affordable, and it is one of the fastest growing cities in all of Canada. And that's largely in part of the, the mayor that uh, Kobe had mentioned was very bullish on new housing starts, density coming into the area. And he, he really did put the city together properly. He, he arranged all of the infrastructure first, arranged tax holidays for all the big box stores. So he got all that in first before worrying about the population which has now caught up. So that's why we're there. There's no magic to it. It's one of the best, we feel, investable cities in Canada. Is it very, very green all around? Yeah, so one of our projects is directly across the street from one of the nicest golf courses in, in the, well, probably on the whole island, the Royal Colwood. It's a private course, but yeah, there's a lot of greenery, of course. There's a Bear Mountain right behind Langford Lake. And you know, you're 10 minutes to the ocean in any direction that you drive, so because yeah. I knew people were going to Comox and Portland. That was mm. 20 years ago. Mm. I think they were way, way ahead of the game. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm just wondering if Langford is in that category now. Is that kind of Langford is, 20 years ago, <coughs> Langford was a little bit like the armpit of the island. Today, it is a, a really lovely city. It's grown massively, as has Surrey Central, right? So we're seeing, you know, the same sort of trajectory there that we are here. I think one of the things I mentioned to you too, Cindy, is that on the island, a lot of the other communities haven't been building 
Langford just started building about 10 years ago, but the other communities haven't caught up. So if you ever um, listen to a city council meeting of Colwood or Victoria or uh, Saanich, uh, Sydney, all of them block a lot of development. Yeah. Whereas if you find in Langford, it's the opposite. They're the ones that are actually building things, whereas the other ones are all blocking. So. Well, mm -hmm. I, I've got the feeling that people are trying to go to the island for the green, you yeah. know? And it, as far as I know, Comox and Courtney, they're not just developing. Hmm. Not know. yet up there so much, yeah. yeah. I think right now it's um, Langford, and then I think a little bit's going on in Duncan in the middle. But besides that, there's, there, everything, everywhere else is pretty slow still, which is why they have the same demographic change that's happening everywhere in Canada where there's a lot of people moving in, but there's not so much housing. So when you see a number up here, like you see Surrey's medium income is 77000 per household. In Langford, it's actually eighty. which when I looked at this um, a couple years ago, it surprised me because um, if you look at Victoria, take down, or downtown Victoria, the average uh, household income there is 55000 so Langford's income is actually quite high for the island. It's not the highest. There's places like Oak Bay and North Saanich, which on the water where all the big mansions are. Mm -hmm. But for an actual town where the workers are, Langford is the, is the, it's the best that we can find. Yeah, I mean, some of the great indicators if uh, you know, a jurisdiction is ripe for growth is Langford actually has a, one of the, the only technical universities on the island coming through, um, and it's a combination of Royal Roads, the Justice Institute of BC, UVic, and Camosun. They're just down the street from that actually Goldstream. It's on Goldstream. They're already in the ground there develop, doing that university. So they're not a retirement community? No. No. No, they're more, they're, they're, a lot of young families are going there because of the price point. Real estate is very affordable. There's lots of housing there as well now. A lot of developers have been going into there and developing. There's a really funny article I can send you if you want. It's an article that they, uh, was written by the Victoria, May Victoria paper a couple years ago, and it was that Victoria used to have this perception as being the oldest city in Canada, mm -hmm. and it was up into the 2000s, but somebody wrote an article where Victoria's fallen out of the top 10 in oldest populations in Canada, but it's only because of length. All the young people moved to Langford and that drove down the whole um, Obviously, because my past experience of, uh, being a financial planner, it's always <laughs> prudent to have these things on here. So, all of these investments that we offer through a mutual fund trust, we work with a trust yeah, so company called Western Pacific Trust, here. and they give us the ability to for folks like yourselves or investors to utilize their tax free savings, RSPs, and even their locked in Lira accounts to invest in these. So, if you ever go to a bank or a conventional broker dealer, they're never going to tell you that you can use private, private, utilize private shares inside these vehicles because they just don't offer it. So part of what we do is we educate folks like yourself on how you can incorporate that through these vehicles because it's always good when you have a high yielding investment to be able to shelter that as much as you can or else a lot of it goes into tax. But these are, and if you have room in your tax-free savings account, you put it in and when you take it out, it's non-taxable, which is great. Um, so tax shelter, there's limits on the contributions, unused contributions carry forward, and uh, there's a wide, wide range of investment, on the investment options, and primarily we're here to talk about the alternative access. So that's pretty much with that. Any questions on tax-free savings, RSPs? How do you withdraw from the, from the RIF? Yes, yeah, very good question. So when we look at using alternative investments inside your RIF account, it's not all the RIF money goes into these type of investments. It's only a certain subset. So we would have to say, okay, based on you turning 71, you, the, your withdrawal requirement will be 5.28% that year. So we would have to compartmentalize that into cash to make sure that you have that payment ready or else it, would, it wouldn't work out. Very good question. Because if it's all locked in and it takes through then we can't get your payment. So we, can't, we, wouldn't, we would never do that. That's a very good question. Are your returns like taxable at your income rate or is any of it like, yeah. like capital gains? Very good question. So not capital gains, it's deemed income. So interest income. So that would be at your marginal tax rate if held outside a sheltered vehicle. 
but eventually you're going to get gains in the top tax bracket. You're looking at maybe like fifty-three percent or something. Sure. When you like when you pull it out. Yeah. So depending on how you do it. So I would say, are you talking about if it was held in the sheltered vehicle? Yeah. Okay. So tax-free savings account. No, because that income, when you withdraw it, is tax-free. The purpose about this. Good question on the RIT, on the RSP. When we start withdrawing from there, it's not like you withdraw the whole capital out. It's only a certain portion of that. So, like I said, based on 71, you're on a RIF schedule, and that RIF schedule starts at 5.28, goes up incrementally until your 90s is like 14%. So that's when you're withdrawing majority of that capital. But if you die at 75 and you don't have a spouse, Pass it to, you're going to get your estate. Yes. Gain. On, based on death, absolutely correct. If you don't have a successor annuitant or a spouse to have a, your rollover, then yes, you will be my income. Sister in law is in the, I don't know if it's the enviable or than she was with her pensions, and she's got about 600000 in RSP. Wow. By the way, forcing her to take it out, she's going to be in a higher tax bracket than when she yeah. put it in. And what I think is unfair that they never tell you when you're putting it in in your 30s and 40s is that most, practically all of her stuff is in capital gains. So she would have kept it outside of the RSP. She would have been taxed at the capital gain rate. Right. Now she's going to be taxed at the income rate. Yeah. Nobody, until about five years ago, Nobody ever told. That. Yeah, so you're right. So there is some prudent tax planning when you're. Yeah, you go get. Your... Yeah. yeah. So you're right. you're right. yeah. So that's the thing, right? So if, if you're doing proper financial planning and you can identify that you have a pension that's going to generate X amount of dollars in retirement as for a lifestyle expense then yeah, I wouldn't be advising you to funnel that much into your RSPs because you're, that's right, you'll lose in that situation. A lot of police officers, teachers, government workers, they often, often in that position, if they don't have a spouse to income split with, because now an RSP, not even a spousal RSP, an RSP itself at 65, as long as one spouse is 65, is deemed eligible pension income and you can split it. So then you can lower your tax, the overall tax burden on the family at that time, but that's, only, that's part of income splitting. So you can income split that, both sides, but I'm not sure if you're... A lot of my clients, Bill, utilize Holdco's for that very purpose, in which case, numbered companies. Okay. So for cash investors who perhaps have maximized their RSPs, use a numbered company and they're just paying small business tax on uh, on the returns there. Just want to touch on one of the sort of strategies or methods to invest and or buy into one of these developments. So and I don't think we touched on the purchase side of buying into Goldstream. So we are we are as Kobe had mentioned the the underwriters. We're not the developer, but we have a close working relationship and contracts with the developer. So what we do and the way that we structure, for example, Goldstream, a 76 unit, low rise, stick frame, price point development in Langford. We try to sell out about 50% of the building internally to investors. And what that does is A, it gets us to our sales test much quicker, and B, we can then help investors to to become the end user of one of the units if that's what they wish to do. So there's never an obligation to buy if you just want to invest. Likewise, there's not an obligation to invest if you just want to buy one of these pre-sale. But when somebody does want to utilize the whole program, it does become quite lucrative. So an investor who wants to buy a unit in the same development that they invested into qualifies for a 5% discount off of the price of the condo. They also get a lowered deposit structure from 15%, which is what anybody walking in off MLS would pay. And we also lower the deposit structure from 15 to 10%, so the lowered deposit structure. And we also waive assignment fees. So we don't do that for others, but for investors we waive the assignment fees so that if you want to flip the unit down the line, you're more than welcome to do that. So there's some, some pretty nice incentives there to buy. And 
the question, and I'm answering this because the question that I get asked all the time is, well, can I use the investment towards the down payment? The answer is no, but yes. Technically, no. Uh, these two things have to be compartmentalized. One is equity, one is a down payment on a unit. Real estate purchase, that deposit goes into a lawyer's trust and the developer has deposit protection insurance so that money gets booked as equity and it's 100% insured and that is basically the trigger for financing, construction financing, when they've met their threshold on unit sales. The investment is into the equity side. Now, it can't be used for your down payment. However, if you're investing, let's say $25,000 and your initial deposit payment on 15% is $50,000. You are lowering the price of a $500,000 unit, let's just say I'm using easy numbers, you're lowering that 5%, which means you're lowering that $25,000. You've just reduced the price of your unit by the same amount that you were going to invest anyways, and that money is making the interest at 15% per year. So you've lowered the interest, or the, the price of the condo. You've lowered the deposit structure, so you're only having to put up 10%, which on a $500,000 condo is 50 grand instead of 15%, 75. So you've, pragmatically speaking, achieved the same thing. So you can't use your investment to award the deposit. But in doing so, you, pragmatically speaking, achieve a very similar result. So the end result of what you're paying is more or less the same. It's just that part of your money is going into an investment earning you 15% per year, and that money can be from your RSP. Probably money that you weren't planning on using for real estate anyways. So it, it does sort of achieve the same thing. So I just wanted to, to touch on that, explain that a little bit. Yes. Thank you, Corey. That's a very good point. Langford has almost no restrictions. So in these buildings, buyer, renter, uh, these are, there's no restrictions on short-term rental, Airbnb, pets, nothing like that. The only caveat we have here is that the city of Langford doesn't want us to sell the whole building to uh, Centurion, Centurion Reach. Uh, they have a bit of a monopoly on everything, so that's the one thing that they've asked us not to uh, not to do. Well, the five percent um, that you said, yeah. is, is, do you have to be an early investor, or can it be like right now? Uh, does anybody get, or is there a certain? That's a good question. Cutoff? Very good question. Um, we don't want to sell the entire building to investors at a discount. We've modeled these buildings to sell about 60% of a building to investors. You know, it, at the end of the day, we do have about a thousand units in Langford to sell over the next five years. It's a very large portfolio, uh, you know, about $700 million worth of real estate to sell over the no next five, six years. If we sell one more, two more to investors, it's a rounding error. So we'll always, we'll always take up the conversation, we'll always have the conversation. The only thing I would say is on, on Goldstream, um, on the Goldstream project, we've already sold 49 units to investors. It's a 76 unit building, which means that some of the premium units have probably already been snatched up. There are some of the more expensive units still available, but we do have other projects. Another one that's coming down the pipeline that's almost identical to Goldstream. That one is available and we haven't sold as many in there. So what is the average um, price per square foot in Langford compared to Vancouver or Surrey? Great question. Yeah, so we're selling at about 730, 750. 7, mm -hmm. 750, 750, 750, yeah. In Langford, it's in Langford right now, the, the, the average price is about 810, 820 a square foot normally. Okay. These developments right now are at about, well, the one that they were selling is at about 750. Um, investors are paying about 715 a square foot okay. right now. Um, the next one's coming up will be, the one that's coming will probably be slightly more, but still under market value. And then the one that's coming after is actually concrete. So it'll be 
um, it'll, it'll probably be about, about the average. It'll be about $800 a square foot or so. Uh, compared to Vancouver. But we are, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you don't want to compare it to Vancouver. <laughs> you know the, the Oak Ridge project? They've already announced that 3,000 a square foot. Okay. So to, to bring that, you know, Vancouver relative to. Yeah, that one, that one was wild. Yeah. Okay. So we're we're a couple of years away from seeing three thousand. Yeah. Surrey's about fifteen hundred. I think we're yeah. Square foot? Yeah. Probably maybe a bit more. more. We're thousand eleven hundred maybe. Yeah. Well, some of these are <laughs> up bigger. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, Depends on where you go, right? Up to fifteen hundred. So we're we're under market uh, average in in Langford certainly, and with with the discount that investors are getting, obviously that that drives it down quite a bit, mm -hmm. which also provides you sort of an immediate lift on your unit as soon as we go to MLS to start selling. Sure. Let's say that another lockdown happens or another pandemic. Do you have anything in place to mitigate that kind of yeah, if if another lockdown happens, uh, <laughs> then I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, these are. It's a good question because we are paying preferred returns, uh, the 15% annualized return. So, uh, from the broker dealer side, you know, that's something that we, when we're discussing with issuers or developers, how do we mitigate for certain things? These, everything that we do is a fixed annual rate of return, generally 15%. Most things that we do are a fixed rate of 15% and those are preferred shares. Preferred meaning that the investors, the limited partners are in first charge ahead of the developer or the issuer. So the limited partners are for better or worse paid before the developer realizes any profit of his own. So he, he has to agree, and again, we, you know, we've looked into various different types of waterfall returns and that sort of stuff in the past. With a structured, fixed, preferred return, it means that for better or worse, we're getting our money out before the developer realizes their profit. In a worst case, I mean, if we're locked down for five years, who knows, you know, he's paying everybody. If we raised 10 million in equity at 15%, and we're locked down for 15 year, uh, five years, you know, meaning that people can't get on site. That's a bad problem for the developer. You know, if we got locked down for a year, let's say, nobody's allowed on site. That's 15% that he's burning on on the equity, right? It's mm -hmm. a million five on. T we have to make sure that we structure these things in a way where the investors are protected as best we can make it for them structured in a way where they're paid first with as much security and as much of the risk already mitigated out as, as possible. So the Goldstream project that we talked quite a bit about tonight, we've got 50 sales, 49 sales already contracted, booked, deposits paid. Uh, there's no debt on the land. We've already paid off the mortgages and we've got development permit approved. So those three things are probably the biggest risk factors on any development. Will you get permitting? Uh, will people have interest in the project, buying the units, and how leveraged are you? How much debt is there on the land? All three of those things, we've checked the box. No debt, we're at our sales test, we've got development permit. It would take, and I'm saying this compliantly, you know, we're not allowed to guarantee things, but it would take something catastrophic, a meteor wiping out Langford, then we've got bigger problems. But the only way that that you know, something like that could happen is if something catastrophic happened. With, with Goldstream, we've, we've sort of mitigated everything out. If there's another pandemic, you know, and we're locked down, yeah, it just means he's gonna have to eat, you know, a year or two worth of, of interest on all the equity that we raise. So he's probably not gonna make any money on that development if that hypothetical thing happened. But so he's taking the risk, not the investment. He's taking yeah. the risk in that sense, yeah. Uh, when any, anything that's to do with timelines, the risk falls on him. Yeah, the whole project is funded by his covenant as well. So when he goes to get bank financing, it's based on his personal covenant, which has all his personal assets. So the, the person that's investing in the program has very limited risk, relative speaking, to the GP uh, on, the, on, on the program. So. Thank you. Thank you.
Another solution for Bill, you can borrow one of the bagpipes. If you get a tenant that won't leave, just stand outside and, <laughs> and play the pipes. Yeah. Get him to go. How close is it to the ferry? About half an hour, 40, 40 minutes. Yeah. yeah, it's about, uh, what is Victoria to the ferries? About 20, 25 minutes and then Langford's about 10, 15 minutes beyond Victoria. I'll say 15. It was 10 until I got a speeding ticket and then, so now it's 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah so we have a referral program. Uh, it's two part. One part is if a you refer somebody in for the part of the investment program on the GPLP, you're paid 2% on that. So let's say you, you refer somebody that had $100,000, you would get a 2% referral fee back to you. You'd have to sign a referral agreement with Charterhouse to be eligible to be part of that program. So that's one part of it. The other aspect is if you're a realtor or a broker, you can actually sign a referral agreement with the issuer and if you do that, you'll be eligible to um, have 2% back on the real estate purchase and the broker keeps their fees and a half percent back there. So there's two part parcel, um, one's on the uh, GPLP and the investment side, if you bring in through an, like an investor through Charterhouse, or if you're a realtor and you sell a unit through uh, the issuer, then you also get paid that 2%. So two and two is kind of the, the the agreement we have there. What's the time frame that you ask on the books? The time frame that you ask that you don't sell? It, we don't really have, it's, no, 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 it's not, it's con it's contracted that you are allowed to flip it. There's no length of term. There's no length of term, no. It's in the contract, no assignment fees. We just, you know, we just ask that you, if possible, you hold on to. What's your ask? Well, no, I, Six months. Six months. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Questions on the brokers? Is it brokers? Keep keys and half percent. What is that? So, oh, sorry. The last point. Brokers. Yeah. For okay. Mortgage brokers. Is that what it means for your brokers, right? Yeah. 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 So, so what it's, is a, the it's a. It's fees and then half a percent of that. So essentially, the way that it usually works with mortgage brokers on our referral side is typically if we have mortgage brokers that are referring into us, they're doing it because they have clients that are investment clients that are looking for a specific product on the island. Usually, what they're doing is they're doing it. If they're going to be looking for a place on the island anyways, they refer them into us. They get the mortgage broker fees when they do that side of it. And then there is a 0.5% uh, amount that goes back to them on the actual real estate side, on the, as a referral in on the real estate side. They do their own fees, whatever their brokerage fees are for the actual mortgage, if they're doing one for their investor. And they also do get the 2% uh, in on the investment side if that person is investing first. So it, uh, it's just a little bit different for brokers because they're not on the real estate side. They do their own brokerage fees and um, that's whatever the fees are. So. Okay. Um, on the, also on the 2% to realtors, um, that's paid uh, so the 2% that's paid on the investment, that's paid out within 30 days of when the investment goes into the, to the issuer. So that's anybody who's any of our refer, referrers, they get their 2% within 30 days of when the money comes into the dealer. Um, that sounds like it can be very quick and it can be if people are investing by cash, but a lot of the times if funds are coming in RFP TFSA, sometimes that can take a week, sometimes that can take three weeks, it really depends. Banks. Yeah, hate yeah. giving away. <laughs> so they often try and do whatever they can. We like to hold on to it. Or we used to. Um, so that, that process can sometimes take a little bit of time. Um, on the real estate, on the realtor side for the 2% commission, 1% uh, is paid um, when construction starts. So after the first draw happens on construction. And the, la the other 1% happens on closing, which is at the end of the development. So, um, if there's investors coming in, they purchase and they're referred in by a realtor, that realtor gets 1% uh, when construction starts and then 1% at the end of the project. Yep. Can um, you get a guaranteed mortgage rate and amount when you sign up for a pre-sale or is it set when closer to finish the project? For the, the guaranteed price? No, okay, so let's say 
just using round numbers, let's say there's a unit for 400000 and you're going to pay 100000 and get a $300,000 mortgage okay. um, at, let's say, today's rate. Can you walk in that, getting that 300000 and today's rate for a project that isn't going to be finished for a couple of years? You wouldn't be able to know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. There's a, depending on 60, 90 days. Mortgages. We don't have refers for the mortgages, but um, no, you'd have to do the mortgage usually within 60, 90 days. Yeah, can you can maybe lock it at 120 rate hold. Yeah. So, in because I've heard cases where the market shifts and the interest rates change, so that let's say when it finishes three years down the road, it might be worth 350000 the interest rates could be 10%, and the bank will only give you the percent of the appraised value and your stock. Yeah, the only thing that I would say that combats that is whilst I mentioned you can't use your investment to towards the deposit, you can use your investment as towards the closing price. So you do have that amount of allocated funds gaining interest, hopefully, uh, you know, faster relative to inflation or markets going up, interest rates. Hopefully that, you know, the 15% is gonna keep up with that. So you, you are kind of bringing more equity to the table. So there might be a fluctuation in, in the markets or the interest rates. Hopefully you've been able to keep up with that and you're bringing a bit more equity to the table by merit of having had your, your equity grow along with the project. But I yeah. think, yeah, as far as I'm aware, it's usually 90 days. It, that's it's probably. a fair point, though, yeah. If you're using lock and lira, yeah. you can't really take it out and put it toward, right? No, you can't. Just put it towards? Towards, like, the purchase. Yeah, it's with the exception of a locked-in lira, yeah. Yeah. There's some ways you can get it out of locked-in, but. Is there? I have a yeah. lira. Do you have a lira? <laughs> yeah. It depends on your income. Well, we have a key. financial circumstances. So. Oh, no, you're going to be in, a finan in financial troubles. For yeah, is it BC? Yeah. It's a BC yeah. legislated? BC. Yeah, they, before they were extremely restrictive. Right. But now, if you do it under financial harvest, it's, financial difficulties. your income has to be between $38,000. Hardship, yeah. $38,000, and they take 75% of that, and they'll drill it down so you can take it. You probably would be able to withdraw with $27,000. Can you just hire a private broker? You can. Stop you can, yeah. The, yeah, the and way you obtain the mortgage is you get the bank private. Yeah, like really a second mortgage, like a private lender. Yeah, you can do that. Public broker. Yeah, a private lender. Charges a fee. Shops, it, shops it, yeah. yeah. You can. Yeah. Yeah. I, paid, uh, I paid 20 bucks for a bag of grapes yesterday. Does that count as financial hardship? But oh my <laughs> God, 20 dollars. <laughs> How big was the bag? Like, well, it's your, you know, your standard it, bag of grapes. Kilogram? <laughs> used to be six dollars. <laughs> oh man. No, it was that save on. Oh, you got taken to the clean. Oh, those are the premium yeah, cotton. Taken to the clean. They, yeah, they are premium. Those are the cotton grapes, candy so. ones. Yeah. They put their premium. You're right. Yeah. Oh. Well, if there any more questions. Anyway, we, we kind of uh, ended yeah. that abruptly. We're, we are. <laughs> we just said thank you, and that's it. No, okay. Right, so, Fan, anything, anything you'd like to say? So we want to thank anyone else for coming. If anybody has any questions, we're going to keep the bar open for another probably hour, <laughs> and then we got to take off. But yeah, if anybody wants to drink anything, ask us any questions, just we'll be wandering around. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah.